friends, because this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Welcome to the Master's Touch Healing Service. You know, we're delighted to be able to bring these healing services to you finally, since we got rid of all of our problems with my computer live. <laughs> and uh, we, we do this to, to uh, glorify God and to heal his children. Now, let me ask you, did you come expecting to receive from God today? Well, my prayer for you today is that you do receive your healing touch from God. But let me say this. If you don't come expecting to receive, you're not going to receive anything from God. So raise that expectation level. Get it way up there. Expect to receive from God, and you know what? You will. Take a second right now to assemble a small piece of bread or cracker and a swallow of some sort of beverage or juice. It can even be water, and you can use cheese or fruit or whatever you have. Set all this aside. These are called the elements of the covenant, and we're going to pray over them and sanctify them as the body and the blood of Christ a little later on in the program. But right now, let's begin worshiping God. You know, it's imperative that um, when you uh, want to get in his presence to usher the Holy Spirit's presence in, you do it by invitation through praise and worship. And the Bible tells us that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. So let's praise him right now. Now remember, if you don't know these songs, then just listen to the words. Let them minister to you, allowing the Holy Spirit to join you as we worship and sing.
She's got more month than she's got money. Works three jobs, she's barely getting by. Bob got a word, his mom's been told it's cancer. So many questions, and all of them ask why. We're living in a broken world, a broken world won't give you any answers. Everything is upside down, wrong is right and right is wrong, but not for long, no not for long. Child's done, don't left everything behind. Daddy's getting tired, his faith is fading. You can't get a water from a well that's run dry. We're living in a broken world, and a broken world won't give you any answers. God's presence with praise and thanksgiving and now as we dwell in God's presence I just want you to embrace the sweetness of the Holy Spirit bask in his presence and open your hearts to receive him you know um, I, I left out a song <laughs> and I need to put it in because it's really good so I'm just going to take one second and add it and I don't know why it was off my list. That's a terrible thing. But it, anyway, it'll just take me a second. Oh, that's not what I want. <laughs> okay. It'll just be a moment, and we're going to add it and play it. Okay? Let me see if I can just bring it up here. Um, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. It's loading. Sorry, folks. 
uh, and this first program back on uh, online, uh, other than just canned, is uh, really has some glitches in it anyway, but they're all me. <laughs> Yeah. 
Father, we come into your presence in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, and they're open wide to receive your healing power with our love and our devotion flowing freely from our lips. We love you, we adore you, and we praise your precious holy name. We magnify you. We thank and praise you that we dwell in the secret place of the Most High, and we thank you that you've already heard our prayers. We rejoice because your word tells us that all of your answers for the believers' prayers are yes and amen in Christ. We thank you for the gifts of utterance, the rhema word of God, the logos word of God, uh, the gift of impartation and revelation knowledge. We thank you that the healing power of God is present to heal all. We give you thanks and praise for sending your only begotten Son to save us and take all sickness and disease from us. We thank you that we are healed, made whole, and completely restored, and we give you all the honor, glory, and praise in the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus, our Christ, the Lord. Amen. You know, the power for healing always follows the Word of God, and that's exactly where we're going next, folks, deep into the Word of God. So, we have to participate. We can't expect God to simply do everything for us. We have to get involved. Now, so far, we have come into His presence, and now as we soak in worship, I would like you to, to speak to His heart, listen to Him, and then speak to His heart as we prepare for His Word and your minds are open and your hearts are expecting to receive. Um, and I'm going to just once again have to add something here, and it'll only take me a minute. <laughs> okay. It'll only take me a minute, and then we're, we'll be on with this. You know, it's as I can tell you too. Like I said, it's vitally important that you understand um, what soaking worship does for you. Soaking worship will bring the Lord into your presence, and you're, it'll be just a marvelous thing. It gets you more more prepared, opens your heart, softens you up, and gets you ready. Good ground, good ground to receive.
Do you know and understand that God can heal you? Well, do you know and understand that God will heal you? You know, you don't have to be sick. And why do I say that? Well, because God wants to heal you. And if you'll have faith, he will heal you. Does that sound pretty far-fetched? Well, it might, but you know what? It's true. You see, the key to receiving your healing from God is to have faith. The Bible tells us that Jesus often said to those he healed, your faith has healed you. However, Matthew 13, verse 58 says, and Jesus did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. So lack of faith can stop God's healing power. Well, if lack of faith, doubt, can stop God's healing power, then faith releases God's healing power. Amen? So what we need then is faith. Now, the Bible tells us in Romans 10, verse 17, that, the, that faith comes from hearing God's word. So I would say this to you. It's vitally important then that we understand what God's word says about divine healing. You see, here's the thing. If we reject God's word, then we reject his healing power. And you know, it's unfortunate, but there are many Bible-believing Christians out there that reject what God says about his healing power. And most of the time, they don't even know that they're doing it. Their rejection is based on two things primarily. Number one, because some people don't get healed when they pray. Or number two, because of traditional teaching. Now people are stuck in a rut of their past knowledge of God and his moves. But here's the point. No one has ever rejected God's healing power based solely on the word of God. Because anyone with an open mind and an open Bible will become a believer in God's healing power. You know, it's clear from what the Bible tells us that Jesus healed and he healed often. Actually, did you know that two-thirds of his ministry was healing and restoration? That's right. Jesus' main ministry consisted of three things. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Our evidence is Matthew 4, verse 23. So we can plainly see that healing was not a side issue with Christ. It was the main issue with him. Well, what about today? Does Jesus still heal, heal today? Well, I want you to listen to Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Jesus still heals today, my friends. Praise God. You know, the Word of God tells us in Matthew 12, verse 15, that many followed Jesus and he healed all their sick. Jesus healed all, not some or most, all. And when I look the word all up in the Greek and Hebrew, all means all. It's God's will to heal every believer. Nowhere in the scriptures do we find that Jesus refused to heal anyone who came to him in faith. He healed everyone who believed without exception. Look, if you don't believe something, you won't receive it. You reject it. If you believe it, you have faith in it, so you receive it. What happens then? It manifests for you. Now keep in mind that there will come a time in every believer's walk when their faith gets kind of wobbly. And what I mean by that is that they don't have what it takes to stand in faith to overcome the horrible situation that's looming over them like the wave of a tsunami. So what do you do when that happens? Well, it's then that you have to realize that it isn't your faith at all that you need to stand on. We stand on the faith of God, the faith of Jesus Christ. So ask yourself these questions when you're faced with that kind of situation. I mean, here you are, you've come up to the, as far as your faith will carry you, you know, it's that you've reached your limit of, of the level that you're on. Uh, so ask him this, or ask yourself this, I mean, does God have the faith to manifest my miracle? Well, sure. He's my creator. Of course he has the faith. Well, does Jesus have the faith to manifest my miracle? Yeah, of course he's my redeemer. Of course he has the faith. Now, when you realize that they're one entity, and they individually and collectively do have that faith, then it's their faith you stand on, not your own. You go to the level that you're on and stop and then grab onto theirs. You see, our faith is limited by the level of understanding of God's word that we're on. To break free of the limitations, reach out for God's faith and stand on that. And when you do that, you automatically move into God's rest. Now, friends, I want you to pay close attention to this. Not only did Jesus heal everyone while he was on the earth, to, to ensure it, our healing for today, he paid for it. Isaiah 53 verse 4 tells us, Surely Jesus took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. So there you have it. Jesus took up your infirmities, your sicknesses and diseases. He took them. And since he already took them, you don't have to have them. Hallelujah. This scripture should really settle any issue on divine healing, and yet some people want to argue with God and fight for the right to keep their sickness. It's beyond me, but they do. 
Now, some try to find reasons why that scripture doesn't mean what it says. A lot of folks will say, and I've had it said to me, this scripture is speaking about spiritual healing, not physical healing. My answer to that was, and still is, this. I don't see the word spiritual in this verse. So you're adding to the Bible. Let's let Matthew tell us what God meant as spoken by the prophet Isaiah. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to Jesus, and he drove out the spirits with a word, a word, and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. Matthew 8, 16-17 It's clear from Matthew that he interpreted the words from Isaiah to mean physical healing, since what? since he quoted it in reference to the healing ministry of Christ. Now, another good reason that we should have faith for healing is this. Sickness is darkness, and it's of the devil. Look at the word devil cross out the D. What do you see? Evil. That's right. Sickness is evil, and it comes from the evil one. It's of the devil, and whatever is of the devil, we don't want anything to do with. Listen to Acts 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the, of the devil because God was with him. And then Luke 13, verse 16 tells us that after healing a woman who had been crippled by a spirit, Jesus said, Should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free? Now from these scriptures alone, and there are many, many others, we clearly see that sickness is not caused by God, but by Satan. And God tells us in James 4, verse 7, Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Now, I know I make this sound real simple and offhand, and it's kind of like I'm saying to you, you're not sick, and yet you sit there with symptoms of dire sickness. Some are in pain, and in many cases, the condition is life-threatening. But I want you to get this into your heart and into your mind. Those are lying symptoms. We don't have to put up with anything that comes from the devil. That includes sickness and disease, lack, poverty, anything at all. Are you listening to me? Satan is a thief, and he's trying to steal your health, your position with God, and you're healing from you. I want you to see who's making you and your loved ones sick. It's the devil, not God. <coughs> Excuse me. So the bottom line then is this. What do you believe? And when we're finished here today, what will you believe? Go with me to Matthew 9, verses 28 and 29. The blind men came to Jesus and asked him to heal them. And Jesus asked them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said this. According to your faith, will it be done to you? My friends, God will do for you according to your faith, your belief. If you believe Jesus still heals and that it's his will to heal everyone, including you. If you believe that he paid the price for your healing. If you believe that sickness is of the devil and that you have authority over him, and by the way, you do. Then you've begun your faith journey to walk in divine health. So don't tolerate sickness. You have a divine bill of rights, from receiving answers to prayer to raising the dead. You know, God set aside for you an absolutely wonderful inheritance, and included in this inheritance is the right to good health. God made sure this spiritual birthright through Jesus, and like him, you have a right to prosper in your physical body. The Bible refers to you as a joint heir or equal beneficiary with Jesus. You'll find that in Romans 8, verse 17. Although Jesus is the Son of God, he came to earth as the Son of Man, born like any other human being. And his purpose was to show us the Father, and once gathering us into himself, show us how to live supernaturally, like superhuman beings in this natural world. Think about it. As a man, Jesus possessed the power to heal the sick, lay hands on lepers, correct blood disorders, manifest new body parts, open blind eyes, cast out demons, and raise the dead. <laughs> what do you think his attitude was towards sickness and disease? Well, he didn't tolerate it, and neither should you. Jesus was inheritance-minded, my friends, and inheritance-minded people are completely confident in the integrity of God's Word. In simple terms, they not only believe in God, they actually believe God. Jesus' attitude towards sickness was the result of his study of the Scriptures, and he knew with absolute certainty that he had every right to exercise his God-given authority in this earth. Luke 4.18 tells us of Jesus' confidence in who he was, what was available to him, and what he was capable of doing. Jesus said, I am empowered by the Holy Spirit to heal, deliver, and set free those who are poor of health and in bondage. So, let me ask you this. What's your attitude towards sickness? Well, I mean, do you accept it as a way of life? You know, many believers, well, 
Let's correct that. Actually, most believers settle for less than God's best where their health is concerned. Some have even accepted the satanic lie that God will put sickness on you to teach you a lesson. And that's a lie right out of the pit of hell. How do we know? Because Deuteronomy 7 verse 15 says, The Lord will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict on you the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt. Now, think about it. What lesson could you possibly learn from getting cancer, heart disease, kidney or liver disease, or diabetes, or even the common cold? Listen to me. Would you, as a parent, give your child a disease, make him or her sick, to teach them a lesson? Absolutely not. Then what makes you think your Creator, who is love, would do that to you? There is no lesson to be learned from sickness and disease, my friends. You have the right to divine health, and it starts with changing the way you think and speak. Romans 12, verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Then Proverbs 18, verse 21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Well, what does that mean? It means that if you're sickness-minded and you go around saying, I'm so sick, it looks like I'm never going to get over this, or if you're one of those who continually rehearses the symptoms, then that's exactly what will happen, says Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. You know, you need to be like Jesus. Take a firm stand against sickness. He's already paid the ultimate price for your healing. Supernatural health is yours, my friends. God wants you healed. He wants you made whole. He wants you well, and He wants you completely restored. Well, you know, I'm sharing with you today some things in God's Word that apply to receiving your healing and maintaining your healing. I'm also going to share some things with you that you may find hard to believe, but I want you to know that they're in the Word of God for all of us to benefit from. First and foremost, let's understand this. Because of Jesus' finished work at the cross, you were healed at the cross. In the book of Isaiah, it tells us, Surely he took my sicknesses, he carried my pains. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, he put him to grief. You see, Jesus took our place, and he took the punishment for all of our sin and broken covenant and rebellion. And this included sickness and disease. He took it. He paid the price and took it specifically when he was tied to that post and was being beaten. You know, people could see the soldiers beating him, but what they couldn't see were the blows that God was beating him with. You know, while that beating was happening to his body in the natural realm, in the spirit realm, he was being beaten by God. That's right. So make a note of this. Jesus took all sickness, disease, and sin in his body, not in his spirit. His spirit was untouched. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 53, verse 10 says this, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he, God, hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he, God, shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. By his bruise we are healed. Okay, well, was it the bruises that the Romans put on him? No, it says that it pleased the Lord. God is not mean. Why would he, ple Why would he want to put bruises on the Lord? Why would he bruise him? Well, I'll tell you why. Because he who knows the end from the beginning could see your face. And he could see my face. Yes, but he was bearing our sins. That's right. But not in this verse. This verse says he was taking our sicknesses and carrying our pains. Young's literal translation says Jehovah was, uh, has delighted to bruise him. He has made him sick. And then there's another translation that says it pleased the Lord to crush him with disease. You know, <clears throat> the beating that Jesus took was horrific then being nailed to a cross is beyond comprehension. I just can't fathom that. But that wasn't the half of it. That was just a very small part of what happened to him. What made him sweat drops of blood in Gethsemane? What made him ask God to let this cup pass? Understand this. Jesus is not weak. Oh, no, my friends. He's not weak. Jesus is strong, yet he fell on the ground overcome with all the pressure of it. Why? Because in a few hours while he was hanging on the cross, all of the evil, the vile ugliness of all of the iniquity and sin from all of mankind, from Adam all the way to the future and right down to the last man on earth, is going to converge on him. It isn't going to, you know, he's not going to just empathize with it. Oh no, my friends, he's going to become it. Then, 
added to all of that, God's going to turn away from him. That's why he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, the full judgment of God for all of mankind's sin and broken covenant has come upon him. Before Jesus went to the cross, he was tied to the scourging post, beaten senseless like a criminal. And the Bible says that Isaiah, seeing it in the spirit centuries before it ever happened, said what? God is bruising him. God is beating him. With each blow, God struck him with the spiritual root of every sickness and disease that mankind would ever know. I mean, all of it. Jesus took that for you. So, let me ask you this. Why should you have to pay for it again? After all, that's why Jesus is at the cross, taking your beatings, sin, sickness, and disease. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. You know, the Bible tells us that during all the trial of Jesus, during all the time he was being beaten, this is what it says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Acts 22. Here, they tied the man of God to the scourging post. Just as they did with Jesus, it hadn't been that long after they crucified Jesus. And as they're tying this man to the post, he, get this, he opens his mouth and says, I want you to totally get this picture. They took off his coat. Tied him to the post. He could hear that guy warming up his whip in the background behind him. Paul says, hey, hey, and the scourger yells, shut up. You're about to be beaten. But Paul yells, hey, is it legal to beat a Roman citizen that hasn't been found guilty and convicted of a crime? Is it legal? <clears throat> now, he knew it wasn't legal, and they knew it wasn't legal. But here's the thing. He opened up his mouth. Why? because he knew about his rights. You see, in those days, if you weren't a Roman citizen, you weren't anybody, you were no one. Uh, it made no difference, I mean, who you are, what you have, non-citizens could be beaten and made slaves, but not Roman citizens. If you were a Roman citizen, you were someone. You had rights, and you had rights that the whole king and the emperor himself backed up personally. Because you had rights, you could appeal your case all the way up to Caesar. You know, Paul did. The Bible tells us that he stood before Agrippa and said, I appeal to Caesar. Now, Paul's a Roman citizen. He can appeal to Caesar. Why? Because he had rights. We have rights, too, as citizens of the United States of America. They're listed in our Bill of Rights and our Constitution. Why is this in the Bible? But more importantly, what am I doing talking about that here in this healing message? Well, Listen to this. The Bible says in Philippians 3, verse 20, that our citizenship is in heaven. That means that your name is written in a book, the Lamb's Book of Life. You see, in eternity, if you are not a citizen of heaven, no matter who you are, who your family is, how important you are or think you are, you aren't anyone. There's only one thing that matters. If your name isn't in that book, if you aren't a citizen of heaven, nothing else matters. But here's the good news. If your name is in that book, you have citizenship in heaven, and you have rights. You have those rights not when you get to heaven. You have those rights right now. Now, most Christians don't know this, so they're silent. They take the stealing of their finances. They take the sickness and disease that tries to come on them and their children. They take it, and they take it, and they take it, and they take it. The devil is stealing from them and beating them, and they're taking it. Why? because they don't know they have any rights. So they don't stand up for speak or speak up for themselves. What if Paul had been quiet? I mean, what if he just sat there and said, well, I've made a lot of mistakes and I guess I do deserve a good beating. Lord, help me to be strong. Help me to take it like a man. Well, if that's all you know, then the Lord will give you strength. But there is something much, much better, my friends. And what did Paul say? He said, wait a minute. He opened up his mouth and said, wait just a minute. That guy with the whip is cracking it, anxious to get on with the program. He's just waiting for somebody to whip and torture. He's going to flay him. He's going to flay you. So what do you say? Hey, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. 
That's right. You tell that devil this. It is not lawful. The devil doesn't want you to know this. He's a spiritual outlaw. He wants to take advantage of your ignorance. He wants you to be quiet and just take it. Now, Paul says, is it lawful for you to whip a Roman citizen? Why? Because he knew who he was and he knew he had rights. Look, when the centurion heard Paul's protest, he stopped the whole thing. So the low-level devil comes to you, and what do you do? You open up your mouth and speak up. You tell him, no, not in my body. You're not giving me this sickness, this disease. Speak it out. Tell him it's not legal. Listen, when you're born again, you become a citizen of heaven, and the devil no longer has any influence over you. I'll say it again. When you are born again, you become a citizen of heaven, and the devil no longer has any influence over you. You see, you are born into the citizenship of the heavens when you accept Jesus as your Savior. And your name, then, is written in that book. That book is a book of the redeemed, a roster of the citizenship of the eternal kingdom of God. Now, as a citizen, you have rights, and you have to know those rights and speak them out loud. Jesus didn't open up his mouth. If he had, legions of angels would have saved him. He could have. When they tied him to that post and beat him, during which time the hand of God was striking him with the, every core cause of every sickness and disease, he could have said, I appeal to justice. I'm innocent. I appeal to Almighty God. If he had, he would have been saved, and we would have to pay the price for our sins. But he did not do that. He didn't. All he had to do was open his mouth and speak, but he didn't. He was silent. He opened not his mouth. He took it. He was being beaten, and he opened not his mouth. Why didn't he open his mouth? So that we could open up our mouths. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Open up your mouth and say when anything negative comes and begins pounding on you. Don't keep silent. Open up your mouth and say, it's not legal. Tell the devil it's not legal for you to touch me. I'm a citizen of heaven. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. You speak up, and the enemy will flee. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Open up your mouth and declare that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Praise God for this information. Praise God for our rights and heavenly citizenship. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, <clears throat> let's go a step further. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it says, As he is, so are we in this world. The he that that scripture is referring to is Jesus. So let's insert his, word, his name into that. As Jesus is so are we in this world. Not only are you where Jesus Christ is, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, but you are also as Jesus Christ is. How is he? Full of perfection in life. His health is the vibrancy of his life. While he was on this earth, he was never sick, my friends. He didn't have so much as a headache or a hangnail. So why can't we walk in that same vibrant health? Guess what? We can because of the profound union we have with Jesus Christ through our faith. Remember, when he found us, we were sinners and separated from God because of our sin. But now we believers are in union with Jesus Christ, us in him, he in us. Through our faith, we are something completely new and different. The Bible tells us in Genesis 2, verse 23, about God taking a rib from Adam and creating Eve. And Adam said this, <clears throat> This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Well, when we are born again, we are born out of Jesus Christ. And we are now, as born again believers, bone of Jesus' bone and flesh of Jesus' flesh. We are a new creation. We have Jesus' DNA. We are born of him spiritually and physically restored to his supernatural health and wholeness. So watch us now. If Jesus is in us and we are in him, then all of his vibrancy of life, all of his attributes, all of his wholeness and divine health are in us as well. Here's an example. When we're born again, we, like a caterpillar, make a great exchange. The caterpillar goes into a chrysalis and a supernatural exchange happens and he comes out a butterfly. Now he remains a butterfly for the rest of his life. He can never go back to being a caterpillar. We will, he will forever remain a butterfly. Now, when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, a supernatural exchange takes place. In the twinkling of an eye, we move into Christ. However, we never come out of him. We remain in Christ for all eternity. Jesus is in us, and we are in him. 
Therefore, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. So when symptoms come knocking, and they will because the enemy doesn't want you to know that it's illegal for him to touch you, speak it out loud. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. You know, it's imperative that you understand this. When Jesus was crucified and afterward went to hell, he destroyed Satan. He took the keys to hell and conquered sin and death. He defeated the devil, took back the dominion and authority, the empowerment of God that was given to Adam and Eve and restored it back to us. He restored us to the blessing. <clears throat> now, when Jesus was on the earth, the Roman army would vanquish their foe and then strip the leaders and captives naked and tie them together single file and march them throughout their territory, showing everybody that they were defeated and they had no power. And this is exactly what Jesus did with Satan and his cohorts. Now, the devil doesn't want you to know that Jesus took away all of his power, so he spends all of his time roaming about like a roaring lion, looking for whom he can devour. That would be those who think he still has power. Now, though, his bark is the only thing he has. He no longer has a bite. These are the only things that Satan can do since then. He can distract you. He can take your focus off of God and the things of God and move it over onto the cares of this world. He is a master at it. <clears throat> Excuse me. He can deceive you, and he's very cunning and sneaking in his, sneaky in his deceptions. He is, after all, the father of all lies, so be aware of the wiles of the devil. But here's the key. There is a key. <laughs> he always attacks you where you lack knowledge of God's word. Then, just to make sure he contains you as a captive, he liberally sprinkles everything he does with fear. Fear is twisted faith. Remember this, the devil can't create. He can only imitate. So, open up your mouth and tell him it's illegal for him to touch you. Tell him you know he has no power because Jesus defeated him at the cross. Tell him you are a citizen of heaven and belong to God Almighty. Then, tell your body to line up with the God's word. You tell your body uh, how, you, how it feels. You never let your body tell you how it feels. You have to understand this. You're not ready for this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Satan cannot give you sickness and disease. What? No, he can't. He can only offer it to you. Satan always works from the outside in, folks. God always works from the inside out. And because Jesus is one flesh with you and the Holy Spirit resides in you, there's no room for the enemy. He can't get in. So don't take sickness and disease. <clears throat> How do we take it? We say it. We open up our mouths and we say it. Actually, what we're doing is we're coming into agreement with it. We agree with what the enemy says about us instead of agreeing with what God's word says about us. Now, the enemy wants us to. The flesh pushes us to. Have you ever noticed that when you don't feel well, the first thing that you want to do is tell someone? If you simply must tell someone that there's something wrong, tell them this way. I'm under attack from the enemy and I'm fighting lying symptoms, but my healing is manifesting. That's the truth. You are under attack. You are fighting lying symptoms, but you're not staking a claim on sickness by speaking it into your body. Jesus laid his life down for us only to take it up again so that we can too. No one can steal your life, my friends. You have to lay it down. Are you ready to do it? Or do you still have unfinished business here? It's your choice, you know. Okay then, how do we maintain our healing? Very simply, by giving God thanksgiving. It's that simple. Thank God every time you think of it. Every time the enemy gives you a twinge, thank God for your healing. When you get up in the morning, thank the Lord for healing you. It stirs up the healing power of God in your body and it goes to work pushing out all sickness and disease, healing you, restoring you to divine health and wholeness from the inside out. Right now, if you desire to come into the kingdom of God, and dwell in the miraculous presence of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, if you desire to be in Christ and avail yourself of his marvelous wisdom, you must give your life to him. It's very simple. It's pain-free. And in just a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do just that.
Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, just repeat this prayer. Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner and surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me and set me free for all eternity from all my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead and sit at the right hand of God the Father. <clears throat> Take over my life and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I renounce the devil <clears throat> and all sin. Lord, I receive from you the gift of righteousness, total forgiveness of all my sins, past, present, and future, divine health, wholeness, and restoration, your protection, direction, your provision, and peace, and the gift of everlasting life. I'm yours. Come into my heart. Take over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for me, but with me, then you're saved. Welcome to the family of God. Rejoice. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us. And we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross. And so we share. Savior Jesus Christ tore for you. He 
the death that brings us life paid the price to make us one. comes to your body is through Holy Communion. The issue with Holy Communion and people not receiving their healing during the partaking of it is rooted in lack of knowledge. And when we take Holy Communion, there are things that we have to do in preparation. So the first thing that we absolutely must do is this, discern the body of Christ. How do we do that? By acknowledging that the bread or whatever you're using as the body of Christ is the vibrancy of the life of Jesus. His supernatural healing and wholeness, his perfection, attributes, everything that is his that is now yours. You could think of it as a pill that's glowing with the Shekinah glory of God. It's healing you as it travels down into your body through your mouth. And then it's pushing out all sickness and disease from the inside out as it goes. Now visualize the condition, the sickness or disease being on Jesus' body. Put the ailments on him in your imagination. You see, you're not giving him something he doesn't want. He already took it at the cross, so don't feel guilty. The enemy's trying to trick you. Oh, that's right. He's trying to trick you into taking it by deceiving you into thinking you've got it. But those are lying symptoms. So put it right back on Jesus in the same place that you've been afflicted. In other words, see yourself with a solution, my friends. This is called spiritual visualization. It's vital you understand it and do it. The next thing we do is discern the blood of Christ. We discern it as the forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future. Uh, restoration of the blessing to our life, the power and authority of God in our life in full operation. 
receiving the gift of righteousness from Jesus Christ, thanking God for his plan of redemption, that you have been given eternal life, life everlasting, and live under his grace. Now, as born-again believers, we have Jesus' bones and we have his flesh, and through Holy Communion, my friends, we have his blood. Hallelujah. We're complete. Now, lift up the elements of the covenant that I asked you to assemble at the beginning of the program, and I'm going to pray. Father, we praise you and worship you with these elements of the covenant. We thank you that your only begotten Son, Jesus, gave his life so that we might live and have life more abundantly. We thank you now as his, th this particular bread or thing that we're using as the body becomes our portion of his healing body and the vibrancy of his life within us. We thank you that this beverage becomes our portion of his cleansing blood in the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. You know, my friends, the Lord's Supper is a personal fellowship. That's right. It's a partnership with Christ. Partaking of one bread, all of us, creates partnership between the disciples as well, and it merges us into one body, and th that's known as the church. Okay, so the Word of God commands us to eat the bread and drink the cup. Continually take the bread, give thanks, break it, and eat it. Then take the cup, give thanks, and drink it, all in the remembrance of Jesus. The Lord commanded that the supper be repeated often. However, in the verse, Paul really doesn't give us instruction as to how frequently the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated. Yet he does imply that it's to be done with frequency, so that partaking of the Lord's Supper continually reminds us of our redemption by Christ from all sickness, all disease, and all sin. So do it as often as you want to and need to. As we are instructed, we discern the body and the blood of Christ as we prepare to partake. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for you, so that every cell, tissue, organ, and bone, all systems, neurological, blood vascular, lymphatic, muscular, skeletal, all of them are totally aligned with God's word and his will that you are and remain healed, made whole, and totally restored to divine health and wholeness. In the name of Jesus, our healer, the Christ. Amen. Partake of the body of our Lord and Savior. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of our Lord Jesus shed for you in celebration of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. For the remission of all of your sins, past, present, and future. In the name of Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior, the Christ. Amen. Partake of the blood of our Lord and Savior. You know, the Lord's Supper is a feast, my friends. It's a feast of living union of believers with the Savior, whereby we spiritually and by faith receive Christ with all of his benefits and are nourished with the vibrancy of his life into eternal life. For that, we are eternally grateful. We're about to go into the Spirit and lay hands on the sick and the suffering and oppressed for healing, wholeness, and restoration. I'm going to pray over you, and as I do, I'm going to administer the healing power of God to all of you. Then, I want you to soak in worship, listen to the words of the music, and let the Holy Spirit minister to you as I pray in the Spirit for your healing touch from God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence, for the healing power of God that you have given us as a gift and a weapon in our arsenal to use against the enemy. We thank you that you have given us the power to bind and loose. Lord, we praise you and worship you and give you honor today as we lay hands on our participants and listeners and administer the healing power of God to their bodies. And we praise you as we see that healing power coursing through their bodies, healing all sickness and disease that would try to come against them from the enemy. We praise you as we bind the enemy and tell the spirits to come out in the name of Jesus the Christ. We lift you up, Lord, and thank you for filling those vacancies with your Holy Spirit, that precious, precious Holy Spirit. Thank you that we believers are bone of Jesus' bone and flesh of his flesh. Thank you, Lord, for healing all who are sick, oppressed of the devil, and need a healing touch from you. 
In the name of Jesus the Christ, we call every person within the sound of my voice healed, made whole, and completely restored. In the name above all names, the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. reminder. When we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, the Bible tells us that we are made a new creation or new creature in Christ Jesus. So remember, we are carried in Christ. Therefore, nothing evil can ever touch us. We can't be sick. Oh, sickness and disease can be offered to us. The enemy can try to get us to take it. How? By coming into agreement with it. Remember, we are totally protected in Christ. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 tells us that as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Hallelujah, my friends, that belongs to you. 
Now, remember what I just taught you in this lesson today. The way to maintain your healing is by giving thanks to God continually. By that, I mean when you get up in the morning, first thing, begin by thanking God for your healing and restoration and that you are in Christ. Then you can get on with your day as usual. Throughout the day, as you think of it, give God glory for healing you and again, thank Him that you are in Christ. At night before you retire, give God thanks again for the healing power of God that's in your body, coming against all attacks of the devil and keeping you healed and whole and completely restored. And thank Him once more that you are in Christ Jesus. Now raise your hands for the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you his peace. May you open up your mouth and continually declare the healing that you have received and give thanks to the Lord Most High. May the Lord continually bless you with divine health and wholeness and make your way prosperous as you walk in his love. Remember, because we are in Christ as Jesus is, so are we in this world. God bless you. Lover of my soul